peace and blessings onto everyone here. Firstly, I want to thank Greet Melt for putting on this event, this wonderful festival. It's my first time here and I'm really impressed by what I'm seeing and I definitely um, feel the positive vibes coming. Um, I also want to thank Abdul Rahman for inviting me to speak here today and giving me the title to this talk, which is How I Learned to Relax and Love Sects. And um, <laughs> yeah, so if, if anyone is not expecting a talk on Islamic sectarianism, I'm sorry to disappoint. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, also, if you're expecting a detailed analysis of uh, 1,400 years of history of Islamic sectarianism, I also can't provide this within the eight minutes I've been given. Uh, but I do recommend you use your libraries as there are many books lit written on this topic. Um, what I really wanted to talk about are just kind of some of my personal experiences and observations, some of the insights that I've made um, growing up as a Muslim in Britain, and how... I find myself now part of a community, part of a space that was alluded to earlier, Rumi's Cave, somewhere where we're kind of um, gauging this sense that's developing of uh, Muslims who want to go beyond sectarianism, beyond this kind of reductionist way of looking at other Muslims, creating divisions within the community, and something which is really kind of uh, been, been a problem for, for us for, for quite a while. And actually, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm really um, blessed to be a part of because um, I myself come from uh, one of the um, major sects in Islam, what Abdul Rahman mentioned, the Shia, which make up about 20% of the Muslim community. And then the other 80% is our Sunnis. And within these, you have further subdivisions. So um, I, I'm not going to go into too much details, but generally it's kind of understood that Sunnis, um, after the um, demise of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they um, took the corpus of learning from his tradition and the Qur'an, and his tradition was viewed through the prism of the companions, the disciples, his families, quite a broad remit of individuals were used to kind of decipher this. And the Shia kind of went for a, a bit of a narrow approach, and they kind of had a different um, sort of um, cosmological spin on the idea of um, successorship. So they looked into um, for, um, looking at the, uh, the people after the Prophet um, and kind of um, reducing their scope mo may, may mostly to the family of the Prophet and certain individuals from that kind of family lineage. And um, within the main branch of Shiism, you have um, 12 of Shiism, which is um, the 12 Imam um, understanding of Shiism, these kind of 12 successors that come after um, the Prophet Muhammad. So my family from Iran, we come from the 12 uh, Shia um, kind of branch, a branch of the Muslim family. Now, this word, again, kind of when we say sect, so for me it became really interesting. A sect denotes that you're a part of something. You know, you're part of some greater whole. And sometimes when you see this kind of sectarian discourse taking place, it, it really makes you wonder, like, why, why are people not aware of this bigger thing that they're a part of? And it kind of becomes this very insular, um, kind of like factionalized understanding of, of the community. And usually the kind of result of, uh, the, the resulting factors for sectarianism in Islam can be given into kind of three categories. And it's usually theological differences, which as we've mentioned before, when you look at Islamic tradition, Islamic civilization, this is something that has been produced by humans. It's been produced by men. You have Islam, the religion is divinely revealed, but you have Islamic civilization, the tradition, and this is the way that people grappled with these sources and developed their understandings of them. So there's a huge array of theological differences which result in various sects. And also you have the kind of political reason sex emerge and historical development of sex and people moving around and whatnot. So again, I'm not going to go into the kind of academic side of it, but I just wanted to get some of that um, out of the way so that I could then focus on my experience. Now, when my family, uh, I was born in Britain, but when my family came here, um, they found themselves in a Muslim community that was very diverse. Again, I've mentioned the majority of Muslims are uh, from a Sunni background. And so growing up, when I went to school, my friends were from all kinds of uh, walks of life. And the Muslim ones were generally non-Shia and primarily coming from the, to the Sunni school. And we got along. There were no problems. My family never kind of ever told me that, you know, we had to treat each other differently. And um, growing up, it was fine. It was only when I got to university and I entered a new 
uh, environment where people were organizing themselves along various lines, and you had this idea of the you know um, the societies. You know, you had an Islamic society, or you know, a cheese tasting society, or something like this. You know, like you, people start giving themselves these identities. And um, I remember even going to the vegetarian society once, and they were like, you know, now we are raw vegans. We don't even cook the food. You know, and I was like, so wait, it's not just about not eating meat, it's about not cooking and you have to buy these blenders where you blend the potato. And it just becomes like, I was just thinking to myself, are we just living in a world where things just get taken to this kind of extreme level and reduced and these kind of caricatures of identity are formed? And in a way, this kind of made me think along different lines when it came to the kind of sectarianism that I was witnessing at university. Because... It was the first time I started being um, defined as, oh, he's a Shia, he's from Iran, he's a bit different, we don't trust him. And I started to feel some of these things happening. And at the time I was studying medicine and I kind of looked into this phenomena as um, maybe like different specializations within the medical field. So you have the nephrologist, the psychiatrist, you know, the, the neurologist, and they have their own domains and they have their very kind of like clique type mentalities that they focus on. But then they understand they're part of this greater thing called medicine and there's a kind of way of engaging one another, there's a language, there's a discourse, and there's a, there's a way that they come together under this greater banner. Now, whilst this was going on in my mind, at the same time I was getting into uh, an underground kind of music uh, that was developing in London called Grime. Now, some of you might have heard of it, they kind of come out of East London, Bo, uh, people like Wiley and, you know, um, I'm not going to go into that, but let's just say that it was, it was an exciting time in, uh, in London music and actually what was so special about Grime is that it kind of captured this angst and frustration that lots of people were feeling living in these like highly urbanized um, uh, kind of housing estates and uh, parts of London where there was just all this kind of pent up energy and it manifested in this um, amazing kind of musical tradition. So, um, but also what I saw with Grime was a very raw um, way that identities were produced, projected and internalized. So you may have heard about things like postcode wars, or people having red bandanas and blue bandanas, or people being to this click or this click. And so for me, when I kind of, I really liked the music of grime because I was into garage before as well. So I like, for me, I was like, wow, this is, this is really, really interesting musically, but there's this other side, which is really divisive. And these people are from the same backgrounds. They're fighting one another. There's this kind of combative element to it. The kind of battles get a bit out of hand and, you know, it kind of turns into something ugly. And I was thinking to myself, actually, you know, this phenomena, I'm witnessing it in a very raw way with, with what's happening in the grime scene. But actually, it's not that different to what happens with sectarianism or even uh, football fans or even party politics, you could say, right? So sometimes this kind of um, going back into these very kind of caricature, reductionist modes of viewing one another. So for me, for me, the, I was kind of making these observations and I was thinking to myself, look, f the way I understand Islam, the way I understand the message that the Prophet Muhammad brought peace be upon him, is he entered the Arabian Peninsula at a time when there was a huge amount of tribal warfare. People were burying their daughters because they were afraid what's going to happen to them amidst these kind of wars that were going on. You know, it was, it was really, really uh, grim. And the Prophet came with a message that was able to bring these people together side by side as siblings in faith. And for me, really, religion, the transformative nature of religion to the consciousness, to change a person and to take people who are warring and create a fraternity from them, this is what I was interested in. And really, for me, this is what I'm saying. I'm witnessing now amongst Muslims this willingness to go past sectarianism and treating sectarianism as almost a kind of racism or other kind of division that separates the human family. And that's why even when I say I come here to Greenbelt, I witness you guys, my brothers and sisters. And really, I feel a, I feel, I feel a presence that I'm welcome here. And, and um, it's, 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 it goes both ways. So for me, religion, Islam... You know, Christianity, these things that we share, they are to bring us together and go beyond this kind of divisiveness that I think sometimes is kind of this um, modernity on steroids we see sometimes with the way that we're dividing things up and not cooking our food. Um, but yeah, just to kind of finish off, I wanted to um, kind of do something that I, that I developed at Rumi's Cave. It was a, a way of exploring the sectarianism within Muslims by writing a grime track 
And so I'm just going to um, produce the last, I'm just going to reproduce the last verse of that here. And it kind of goes through this um, narrative where it looks at some of the caricatures that the different sects have about one another and they use to identify vis-a-vis -vis each other. And the, the last one is just saying, look, we're just Muslims. Why don't we just like stick with that, you know? And um, like, why, why is it a problem if someone wears a veil on their head or if they pray in this shrine and not that one? So, um, yeah, I'm just going to end on this point. Um, now some call it Muslim, what about that? Why are we beefing like it's rap? Divide and conquer, that's a bait trap now since day one, but that is a fact. I'm not saying forget the divisions. I'm exposing what we do with them. Partly fiction causing friction, set to a beat with rhythmic diction. Nah, it's a devilish feeling when you call about the kuffar, I'm reeling. It's devilish talk when you backbite that school of thought and nah, it's devilish vibes. Never check facts, just spread them lies. It's a devilish tide and we keep surfing along for the ride. See a next man wanna pray in a shrine. You say it's wrong, but they say it's fine. You don't have to go inside that shrine. Link your boy outside that shrine. See a next sister, cover her face. Wants no one to see her face. If you really wanna see her face, then marry that girl, see her face. We need to get on a get along ting. Too many men are on divide and see I'm on a side that looks to provide long term solutions, not a long ting. A wise man said, Islam is a garden, no one sect can be the one guardian, each one tend to a different leaf, flowers, plants, grass, trees, we need to understand. Some people think differently, um, we need to understand. Some difference are bound to be, and um, we need to understand how to bring you close to me, because if we don't understand, our enemies will mark us easily. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.